Friday that we will never forget and our prayer is that we come before the God of heaven and he speaks that's our longing that this good Friday 
that we would just be aware of the great news of a God who sent his son to save us. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to come and have a few thoughts as we prepare our hearts as we worship. Let's pray. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Father, as we come in these moments, uh, we are men and women who are amazed at grace. Uh, we're those who can truly cry out and declare we are forgiven. We have been made new and it's not because of ourselves but because of your amazing love that's been poured out uh, in and through your son the Lord Jesus. And so as we come this morning uh, with all that's going on externally that we would know there's a God who rules this world and he has demonstrated eternal love through his son and we will praise him and we will know the joy that's ours in him. So do us good and thrill our hearts we pray for your name. Amen. Well, the cross of Jesus Christ changes people. When a man or woman uh, meets Jesus Christ and understands the cross, uh, they're never the same again. Uh, the Apostle Paul, a great academic, a great thinker, someone who would look out at other people and make judgments about their intellect and how they behaved. When he met Christ and understood the cross, he became someone different. In fact, he sums up a way that he looks at the world. Uh, this is what he says in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Isn't that astounding? As he looks out at his relationships, as he looks at men and women that he meets, his understanding and his judgment of them is not what they do in the flesh. Something has changed where he's not adding up what people are doing. And it's because he's met Christ. He's seen the emptiness of his life outside of Jesus Christ. And so his judgment isn't made on what people do in the flesh, but how men and women stand before what Christ has done for them. Uh, he's another apostle, Peter, uh, religious, uh, brought up a Jew. And yet when he looks at all his Jewishness, all the books of the Bible he's read, uh, the laws that he's kept, he sums up uh, the life that he once lived. Uh, it's found in 1 Peter and chapter 1 and verse 18. Knowing this, he says, that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers. Isn't that an incredible statement? As he looks back at all of his life as a Jew, as someone brought up maybe to uh, eat certain foods and practice certain disciplines, he sees the emptiness of it by keeping these things. And futile just simply means empty. Uh, it's life without life. And then he goes on to say something's happened. Something has changed my view of myself, my view of the world. I'm a new man. And listen to what he says. It's only the next verse. But he's known a rescue. How? How can someone who sees his life as empty and futile, a life that's made new? And verse 19 tells us with a precious blood of Jesus. It wasn't so many years ago in our churches up and down this land, both young and old, when they were asked to sing their favourite hymns, when they were baptised, they would choose hymns that are well known to many of us. Now listen to some, maybe they're your favourites. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now here's another one. There's a fountain filled with blood poured from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains uh, the blood has never lost its power no never redeemed how i love to proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the lamb you'll hear it in some of the prayers of the older christians unashamed at the blood of jesus christ and so for paul and for peter Freedom and life it isn't built on what we do in the flesh, but it's built in what God in Christ did on the cross. His blood was shed. And we should never be ashamed of the blood of Jesus Christ. He died the death that I needed to die and blood was shed so that I might be forgiven. But on this Good Friday, I want to ask a question as we look at the wonderful news of a saviour. Why is it that God should set his love on me? Why would God... Reveal to me 
revealed to Peter, revealed to Paul, the great news that a Jesus should come and a Jesus should die for him. Now, why would God reveal the mysteries of heaven even to me? So we're going to look at a part of God's word. It's in the book of Romans in chapter 5 and verse 6. And I want you, as we listen to this being read, how there are two people that are being placed forward. You and me, we're the sinners, and there's Jesus Christ. What would Jesus Christ do for sinners? And we were reminded, as I prayed at the beginning, that famous verse, for God so loved the world. Here's Jesus given as a gift from the Father. What kind of gift would God the Father give for sinners? So here's God's word, Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we do not know or have not been justified by his blood, but much more we've been saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And when you read those words of what God in Christ has done, we should be singing, how precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. There's something to praise. There's something to worship, someone to glory in. And it's not looking at me. And it's not focusing on what I've done, the laws that I've kept. Like Peter, we can say, it's futile, it's empty. Someone has come and someone has done something to make me whole. So why would God reveal those glorious truths to me? And why would he allow me to look at the blood of Jesus? And there are millions in this world today who will be looking at the day and seeing what the day will bring. They will be turning their televisions off and looking at the latest news that hasn't really changed. But there are men and women like you and me, and we glory in the cross. Uh, we've sung earlier about the power of the cross. And later we're going to hear about drawing near to the Christ of heaven, waiting on him. And we see a Jesus who's died and we are filled with love. And we're filled with praise because it's precious blood. And why would God reveal that to us? And why would he show that? Well, look at what Paul says as he describes men and women that God has drawn near to. Uh, verse 6 tells us, while we were still weak. It's a little phrase that encapsulates our weakness, how incapable we are. And so for men and women who were revealed the greatest truth about who Jesus is, he came, he died. He gave his life in our place. It's to men and women who, in and of themselves, because, well, because of sin. And sin really is that rebellion against God. It's me and you saying we want things our own way. It makes us incapable of, of adoration and of worship and of seeing the treasure of who Jesus Christ really is. Now, sin makes us selfish. It sees our life centred on who we are. We don't see the heart of the God of heaven. And so to men and women who are weak, incapable, no chance of saving ourselves, Jesus comes. Verse 8, while we were still sinners. Uh, not just weak, but while we were rebels. Uh, while we were saying to the God of heaven, we don't want your ways. We want ourselves to rule. We want our own purposes to be outworked. While we were still sinners, uh, the undeserving love of God draws near. And then later in verse 10, while we were enemies. See, it's not a neutral position. Uh, being a man or woman who's weak, who's incapable of, of loving God, of knowing God. A man or woman who's an enemy, in, in a sense a sinner who turns their back on God. As an enemy, it's not neutral. We're saying to the God of heaven, we want to be in your place. We want to rule. And so later on in this passage, it talks about God's wrath being against us. In fact, if you come to chapter two of Romans, chapter two and verse five, we see something of that position 
We're not neutral men and women. We're not saying, well, I, I don't really understand. When we sin, when we put ourselves on the throne, the God of heaven says, that's not a way to live. And there can only be one king, and I'm the king. Romans 2 verse 5, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. Now we're finding ourselves in extraordinary uh, times. Uh, we're two metres apart, we're queuing up at supermarkets, and we look at the world, there's a silence and there's a stillness. But yet if you were to see someone uh, walking into a shop uh, without a mask, coughing, uh, with hot sweats, uh, would you go up and give them a hug? Uh, would you welcome them into your homes? <laughs> you would say, keep your distance, uh, because you understand the horror, the tragedy. And I want to ask you this. Would you want heaven to be a place where anyone can just walk in? Would you want heaven to be a place where you can just walk in, unchanged, with you being the centre, with you wanting your own ideas and your own ways? Would heaven really be heaven? Or would heaven be really be hell? It'd be the continuance of what we know now. See, heaven's a place where the eternal God dwells in all of his beauty, in all of his perfection. And he's light and darkness. And this is the great news. Heaven, but there's no darkness and there's no imperfections. But it's because of that I can't dwell there. And so God's anger, his wrath, it's a steadiness against what's opposed to him stands against us and yet the good news of the gospel says this something happens this is why peter rejoices why paul rejoices look at chapter 5 and verse 9 romans 5 verse 9 it's talking about the future it's talking about how wonderful the blood of jesus is since therefore we've been justified by his blood much more we've been saved by him from the wrath of god see something's changed for a man or woman who meets Jesus Christ is the man or woman who can stand before God. They're justified, they're made right, they're made clean. And so through the blood of Jesus Christ, we're able to draw near. But the question is, why would God reveal that to me? Why would he show me this? And we find ourselves in the same place. Oh, how precious is that blood that makes me white as snow? This isn't about me and what I've done. Good Friday is a reminder. Paul's reminded us here. This is the God of heaven. It is an extravagant love for you and me. Do you feel loved? Do you feel alone? Uh, do you feel that no one cares? He's Paul saying, in Christ Jesus, there's one who cares. There's one who's poured out his love. Listen again to the heartbeat of this. Verse 6. While you were still weak, what did Christ do? He died. Verse 8. While we were still sinners, rebels, Christ died for us. Verse 10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So here's the God of heaven seeing you and me in our weakness, seeing us in our rebellion, seeing us as enemies. And what has he done? Out of his love. It's the demonstration of his big heart. He draws near and he speaks and says, what can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that Jesus has come. Billy Graham, before he passed away, shared a glorious story of a, a young Maasai warrior called Joseph. He was going along the dusty roads in South Africa when he met a man who shared the good news of Jesus. What you've heard this morning, that you're enemies of God, that you're weak, that you're sinners. And yet God in Christ, he came. He died in your place. He died the death you deserved. He shed his blood in your place so that you would be forgiven. And in that dusty road in South Africa, he cried out for forgiveness. So thrilled was Joseph of what God in Christ had done. He thought he'd go back and tell his village of the great news of Jesus Christ. And he stood and the village gathered around him. And he started to proclaim to them, Jesus Christ saves he explained to them that we're sinners before God and we need a saviour. And a saviour has come and it's nothing to do what we've done. We're futile, like Peter says. We're men and women who judge each other by the flesh, like Paul says. But Christ sets us free. And the men grabbed him 
and the women beat him with barbed wires. They threw him out the village, close to death. And as he lay there, tending his wounds, he asked God in heaven to forgive him. Oh God, was there something that I said? When I heard this great news, I responded, Jesus Christ saves. Forgive me, Lord. And he went through the message again. Men and women are far from God, they need a saviour. And when he got strength, he went back into his village. And as he walked into the village, as he started to explain to them what God in Christ has done, that God out of his love sent a saviour. We're rebels, we're, we're weak, we're sinners. They grabbed him and they beat him so severely that they left him to die. Three days later, he started to get strength. He drank some water and he said, these men and women need to know the God of heaven. A statement he says, oh God in heaven, you died for these men and women. They need your forgiveness. They need to know the living God. And so he went back into the village. And before he could say a word, they grabbed him again and they started to beat him and they started to hurl insults at him. But just before he closed his eyes, he noticed one of the women. And as he looked to them, tears were coming down their face. Days went by. And when he woke up, he realised he was in his own bed. And the village of, of men and women who were opposed to him, who didn't want to listen to the message, this whole village came to understand. God demonstrates his love to us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so here's the great news as we gather here on this wonderful day. God, the cross declares, God loves you. The cross declares to you that with Jesus we can face to the wrath to come. But I want to finish this morning with a great thought. Yeah. Why has God set his love on us? Because he's the God who loves. He's the God who's full of mercy. He's the God who comes to those who, just like Joseph, we've turned our back. We've not wanted him and he's come again and again until we've responded and said, yes, Jesus is mine. Jesus is Lord. But Paul comes in this passage and reminds us how we can be today. Know what God in Christ has done and rejoicing in what Christ has done. It affects how we behave today. And listen again to verse 8. Paul says, but God shows his love for us in this. And we could have said, like some versions, that God demonstrates. He doesn't say demonstrated or didn't say show as if it's in the past. This is something that's happening now. God's continually showing his love to us in the present. Why does God do this? It's because of something that's happened in the past. Now listen to what he says. God shows his love for us continually. Why? Because while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Historic event happened, Good Friday. Christ died in the past, but the effects of that love continue today. And if we understand that, then we will be able to, on this day, in our homes, uh, with all that's going on in the world around us, be able to say, verse 5 is true for me. I come again to uh, Romans chapter 5, and I want to leave you with these thoughts. Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Hope does not put us to shame because God has poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, his love. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Today, I can know and be taken up with what God has done. God has demonstrated his love today because of what has taken place in the past so that I might know in my heart, know in my life, the joy that he is mine forever. And we're going to hear Katie. And she's going to sing to us a song. Uh, we know the song, I Will Wait For You. Just listen to the words. And as you listen to Katie sing, and as she, in song, brings us to that place where we can confess, personal confession, where we can adore, where we can praise, where we can contemplate, and use this time so that maybe for us, this would be a good Friday where in our hearts, in our Christian experience, 
we were able to say the love of God was poured out in our hearts. Cry for mercy. 